Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are and what you have revealed about who you are through your son, Jesus Christ, now human. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit for times like this where we get to gather in your name because you've called and drawn us together to know you more and to talk about you, and to worship you and witness to you as you grant grace and opportunity. So we just ask today as we gather with you and with one another in your name and by your spirit that you would inspire the conversation, that we really would know something more of you today, especially inspire Gary, uh, my good friend and brother, uh, in, in his responses today and Marty as usual and his great asking of questions and drawing out the uh, central things that it seems you are leading us in today. So we love you and thank you for all who are gathered here. And we just appreciate this. We love you and we thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Timothy. So, Amen. Gary, this this article we're looking at today has multiple manifestations of it. As you pointed out, it originally came in the book, in that book on being Christian and human. Yeah. Essays in celebration of, of Ray S. Anderson. And then you've put it in the Participatio journal as a another offering for people in the world to get out there tell us just a little bit about your relationship with ray anderson personally not just academically that uh, is part of your story and is implied in this yeah that's right well i've known uh, ray for lots of years well he's passed away but i suppose i i still know him um so my last year there was some shenanigans going on at westmont college in the mid seventies, as I was a student there from 69 to 73. And uh, <clears throat> so there was uh, changes over for the theology teacher uh, and all. So my last year, my senior year as a religious, the change from biblical studies to religious studies, the title of it, but I still regarded myself as a biblical studies major. Um, but anyway, uh, the theology teacher that I'd been uh, studying with at Westmont was relieved of his duties. So my last year at Westmont College was Ray Anderson's first year teaching at Westmont College. Okay, so we began a relationship there. Most of my friends who were interested in theology, philosophy, um, were the, the year behind me. And so I went on to Fuller Seminary. Um, but most of my best friends stayed on a second year with Ray Anderson, right, at Westmont. Well, then several of them uh, then came over to Fuller Seminary. They followed me the next year. So my middle year, some of them who still had relationship with Ray Anderson. Um, uh, so we got to know, I got to know Ray through them and directly well, the first year. Well, then the third year at Fuller, Ray Anderson left Westmont and came to Fuller. So my last year at Fuller was also Ray Anderson's first year teaching <laughs> now at uh, Fuller Seminary. Uh, and so then I stayed in touch both my, with my friends and others. And of course, uh, a little bit later, I did not know Todd uh, Spidell and, and Chris Kettler at that time, but of course, they were doing their doctoral work under Ray Anderson. So through Ray, I got to know them. Mm. Now, of course, Ray uh, also introduced me really to T.F. Torrance. I had already been introduced to, to Bart and, and others at Westmont um, through my former uh, theology teacher, who was David Weddle, W-E-D-D-W-E-D-D-L-E. Um, and so, but, uh, Ray in introduced us to T Tom Torrance, which I'd seen his name on Bart's church dogmatics, you know, on the cover. <laughs> I didn't know who he was and didn't pay any attention. Who, who pays any attention to who the translators are or the, <laughs> <laughs> the editors, right? Yeah. Nobody. And then I realized he's a theologian in his own right. And then, so standing in the bookstore, uh, Fuller Seminary uh, Bookstore, having heard the name uh, of Torrance and hearing Ray talk about him uh, some. Uh, and then 
uh, I picked up uh, Theology and Reconciliation in the Fuller mm -hmm. Bookstore. And two hours later, someone came up to me and said, we're closing now. Would you <laughs> like to leave? Because I had been standing in the, in the aisle reading Theology <laughs> and Reconciliation for two hours. Wow. And I said, there's something Do you remember what stood out? Do you remember Pardon? what stood out in that reading in that first year? What captured you in that moment? Because that's a. I, I moment. think it was the realism, actually, to give it a name and a label. I didn't know what it was exactly, mm -hmm. except it sounded like Ray. Yeah. And it seemed kind of more real than any mm. of the other theology I had heard. But it also did uh, pick up on some other things that it, I picked up earlier on. Uh, by being involved in youth ministry for many years. Uh, mm -hmm. So all the way through uh, uh, my undergraduate, I did youth ministry, um, both in the summer and during the school years, mm -hmm. uh, and then full-time during the summers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know? And so there are certain clues that I had, had I picked up um, from reading Bart that sounded even more lively in Torrance mm -hmm. and was alive and ray anderson yeah uh, i also kind of sat in on some of ray anderson's classes at his first couple of years at, at fuller he had standing room only huh. in his classes he had to make it a rule that if you're not actually signed up for credit for my class you cannot come in the room and sit down you have to let the students who are actually taking this class for credit come in yeah. and take their seats then after that you can come in they filled the aisles they stood all the way across the back of the room and if you know fuller seminary there's kind of an outdoor balcony serves as the kind of hallway the doors are external we'd leave the doors open and people were sitting out on the balcony huh. listening in through the doors huh. and what was it about ray that, that what was the buzz you got to come here, Ray Anderson, because. Just because of what he says. I mean, they, they didn't, they couldn't quite. I, I just have to say is he's talking as if God was real and present and mm. active and known in Christ. Mm. Right. Uh, and that, that was real in a very, well, personal way, personally real that had to do with our real relationships as individuals, as uh, the church, um, mm -hmm. and in society. And so, yeah, it was that um, it wasn't an act, he wasn't teaching us a system of theology. And part of it is he engaged, he was set up his classes with a lot of questions uh, to pose. And then when we couldn't answer them, just launch. <laughs> uh, and so uh, and he was also personally available to students and actually mm -hmm. uh, well, anyone who knows Ray, um, if you wanted to meet with him, you know, he was available mm -hmm. regularly. And then some of us started going, well, a few regularly and others very irregularly like myself. I would go to Ray's kind of home church that then started meeting uh, at an elementary school. Uh, hmm. down in Huntington, uh, at Huntington Beach, where his house was. Um, and uh, the, the gospel was healing. So what do you remember happening in the church context? How did his theology live in a worship service on a Sunday morning? Well, one of the main things uh, I realized, of course, he was talking about, not abstract, he was talking about the grace that is Jesus Christ. And of course, in relationship to the Father and the Son and the Spirit, very trinitarian, trinitarian, uh, and focused on Christ and the incarnation. But the other thing that was most notable at his uh, little worship service is the message made you so ready uh, to take communion. It was the only thing you could think of doing next because mm. he wove it in and saying, "And so here is Christ." Come and receive him hmm. now at this table. Yeah. And that was your act of obedience. You want to say is, you know, you want to act on the on the gospel, the way he proclaimed Christ as the gospel. 
or Christ and his gospel, mm -hmm. then, then it just he just wove it in. And so now here is Christ. Come and receive him. Mm -hmm. And it was the most natural thing. It was your first, as it were, act of obedience mm -hmm. to come and, and receive it. Well, he would offer it and then we'd pass it around. Mm -hmm. um, so it was so woven together uh, that the, the practical application of his uh, proclamation of the gospel was to receive Christ. Mm. That was the practical application. Yeah. Every week. Pretty, pretty every week. Huh. It really was. Mm. really was. Yeah. And there was a surprising variety of people uh, there um, who met. He also had a, a midweek meeting, I think sometimes. I don't know how often. Or maybe it was uh, on Sunday afternoons uh, uh, as well. You but, didn't go uh, to that, though. Uh, just once. Uh -huh. just, just once, yeah. Was uh, it any, was I, it different? Was not right next door to Pasadena. Uh, yeah. So you had to make a commitment to do that. I was involved in other churches at, yeah. at the time. But, um, yeah, it was just present, alive, yeah. word speaking. And, I mean, it... Uh, the enthusiasm, well, it was a very steep climb because Ray used his own language. Uh, so part of it is he, he found so much theological language that was standard, uh, unhelpful and misleading. Mm -hmm. So what he did is he really invented his own vocabulary uh, to talk about it. And that's legitimate in the way is that the old vocabulary has a lot of misleading connotations, denotations, and all so he just broke off what would and be so an example you had to of listen that. you didn't really figure out what ray was saying until you took two or three of his classes but you knew yeah. it was the gospel truth can you give you us some examples it. of that new language that he would bring uh well i mean some of it uh, let's see if i can remember kind of how he would uh relate to things well his you know his idea of praxis uh would be kind of one kind of thing but uh also how he would talk about the logos you know of god and all that you know uh so well his book the historical transcendence you know of the reality god, of god. Uh, use all kinds of uh language that would um so I actually, I actually didn't follow in, in Ray's stead in terms of that. I always tried to link it up and help people start here and then turn the corner, which is not easy to do, but it's yeah. what I had to do. And so I, I led others more to start out with the language they use and help them to redefine it and re-illustrate it mm. and all that would lead to the same place. But some people wouldn't. What happens is they got frustrated um, because he he wouldn't talk in exactly the same way he was trying to stimulate their hearts and minds and get yeah. them to listen to scripture mm. um and so they would get frustrated and what i saw is a lot of people started up the hill i illustrated this way with with ray they'd start up the hill because they know this is one worth the climbing but it was so steep to get to the <laughs> to the top that they then they just let off and then slide back down but huh. those of us who persevered because we needed something better, yeah. deeper, truer, more real, uh, and personal as well, kind of mm. went up the hill and then got to the top. Uh, and then you kind of come down the backside. But if you don't reach the top, you'll just slide back down. Uh, and that's what did happen uh, to many. But those who mm. uh, persevered, and of course mm. it was... Ray and really Tom and James Torrance um, and then also Carl Bart really all together uh, mm -hmm. were pushing in the same direction. But anybody who's read Bart or Torrance knows your head hurts when you're first reading them. You, you don't know kind of like what, you know, there's something there, but you don't know what it is. Um, and that was, that was true uh, for Ray, but it's true for any of them. Why is this so hard? Why does my head hurt after this? Um, and 
I mean, one of the ways to say it is we're, we're not being just trained to think new thoughts. We're trained to think differently mm -hmm. or to think with different tools yeah. than we're, we're used to, you know, stop using a hammer and try a screwdriver, you know, it's, <laughs> um, so yeah. if you're using the wrong tools to try to think the faith, uh, and then it's not, it's not going to work. So yeah. if you just rip the tool out of your hand, <laughs> shove another one. <laughs> What's that? Uh, I was yes. a little more gentle, but especially the other faculty got very testy with with Ray, and he got testy with them. So he ended up calling himself, as you all know, the Maverick theologian. The Maverick theologian. Yeah, Ray may and have by had that a little bit too much fun being the Maverick. <laughs> but people wouldn't listen to him and and follow up with him uh mm. and all and so the same would happen with tom torrance even when he came to to fuller mm. seminary for the the Peyton lectures which i yeah. attended one or two of them and which uh todd and uh and chris uh <clears throat> put together and all but so many faculty got really testy uh with Tom when he was there for the Peyton lectures uh, and all, because a lot of his reality in evangelical theology was what that turned into. But he was questioning how how you go about theology and biblical studies. And, and what was he particularly that. calling the question in those lectures? What is it that he was saying we can't do it any way that or that way anymore? Well, part of it is kind of the the methods uh, used were kind of analytical. Mm -hmm. and, and or rationalistic uh they didn't make the living christ as presented in scripture the actual mm -hmm. center living center of things so another way is they were um maybe to talk about it is they were those who came to fuller most of them had some kind of real living faith but then mm -hmm. in the classes you had to kind of back out of that and become hypothetical unbelievers because uh, the, the idea is that real lived faith, real piety, or to use Athanasian terms, well, and biblical, godly uh, terms, was a bias. So it was really, uh, you were taught for understanding to seek to, to legitimize faith. Hmm. And then if your understanding of the historical background of the, of the books of the Bible and what plausibly, you know, Jesus might have said or might not have said. Um, and of course, they would end up in a conservative fashion. And, but the thing is, you had to go through this process of understanding, understanding, analyzing, analyzing, uh, proving. And, and uh, it really was biblical studies and apologetic and theology as apologetics to defend mm. themselves against the dispensationalists whom they left and who treated them horribly and uh for leaving for abandoning them and also the liberals uh they were being battered and bashed on both sides so a lot of their what needed to happen and was happening at fuller was uh kind of defensive you could see this in in mm -hmm. edward carnell and what he was trying to do uh, with a kind of slightly different version of apologetics but so much of it was Defensive. I mean, even George Ladd said, I spent my, I forget how many years, I think 20 years trying to write a definitive New Testament theology that could not be ignored or denied on the continent. And the first review completely obliterated and said, this is trash. It's not even worth listening to. And that was the end of George Ladd's huh. work being used on the continent. That huh. was it, and it devastated him. But you see that that need to defend in, in such a way, uh, that goal, you know, kind of set him up. Yeah. He would break down, George Land would break down in class when he'd get yeah. to those parts in his textbook uh, uh, where Perrin, uh, not Nicholas Perrin, <laughs> Norman Perrin, uh, the New Testament scholar in the 60s, huh. just you know, ripped him apart and just said, this doesn't, you know, prove anything about the divinity of Jesus and, and all that. Uh, uh. So, um, but yeah, 
So Ray was switched over uh, to out of the department. It was an interesting story, but he was switched out of the uh, offering courses uh, for core credit in the MDiv program and then was switched over to the DMIN program. But by the providence of God, that's where he belonged. Um, because? because to bring together actual lived life and mm -hmm. you know doing theology faith seeking understanding not understanding yeah. seeking to justify faith huh. or promote it and then tempting students to become um to become uh, hypothetical unbelievers in other words you're a believer but now we're going to analyze this as if we aren't so become hypothetical unbelievers Use mm. other criteria for what is true, what is good, what is right, whether who Jesus is, what he's done for us, how he's done it uh, for us, and let's analyze this. And then if the at the end of the uh, analysis um, it's warranted, then you could come back and affirm your faith. Mm. And I watched a lot of students uh, who were not ready for that kind of both spiritual and psychological gymnastics um, for whatever reasons to kind of fall apart in their faith. They just mm. couldn't take it. They came in believing and wanting to bear witness to Jesus Christ. And they thought the seminary was going to help them. And some classes did more so than, than others. Mm. Um, but the methods of education and, and learning uh, being so analytical and philosophical um, and I watched this happen in Paul Jewett's class as well. Mm. Uh, there, as that, no, you know, it took me a while to to figure out that he was uh, teaching us Bruner's theology. Mm. Uh, no wonder he didn't like Karl Barth. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, no. but it took, took took us a while. Or took me a while. I had studied Bruner as an undergraduate um, but uh, yeah it didn't really come across but as genuine and uh, full of real belief as Paul Jew was and integrity as a person and all the, the method was fighting mm. the content mm. um, and so you, it was a really long route you know to take all the analysis and see how it would feed faith and worship and service and build relationships yeah. of ministry. Um, yeah. It was a long, long route. Um, whereas Ray, you know, you were confronted. It was a steep climb, but you knew he was taking you somewhere that yeah. you wanted to go. Um, has, has Fuller escaped that today? Uh, no, I don't think so. My well, personal yeah. opinion is... Uh, not at all yeah i mean one of the it's it's endemic all over i mean this this actually does get into my paper is these these methods are reductionistic they they right. the methods themselves of study can depersonalize and dehumanize you because it, it kind of separates your mind into analytical uh pieces mm. and kind of either the pragmatism that I, I talk about here, either it ends up analyzing things in a utilitarian way, how to do stuff. Yeah. You know, one way or the other, or how to find common ground with the unbeliever so that you can outmaneuver them on their mm. ground, and win them back. And that's so certain kinds of apologetics are of that sort, but you've already, you've already given away the game. Uh, you're on a different as field. As you give them the common ground. As soon as there's common ground apart from Jesus Christ himself, hmm. um, then they always say as well, we're already agreed on the most basic and fundamental things. So yeah. why, sh why should we agree? It's incidental that we agree with you or disagree with you on secondary tertiary matters. Yeah. We're already agreed on the most common thing. Yeah. And so, for instance, uh, I had long conversations, very good conversations, uh, with with Daniel Fuller, and uh, he was a great listener and a great arguer and one of the fairest persons I've ever argued with. Huh. Um, and 
But to basically, you know, he, he wanted to argue that the reason we believe in Jesus is because that's the only explanation for Paul's conversion. Huh. So what we really believe in is Paul's conversion. And then by logical inference, we believe Jesus was raised from the dead. Hmm. Or another part of it is I learned more from Fuller, from Daniel Fuller, took, <laughs> I think more classes from him than any others, but they were on the exegetical parts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned and took away a lot from him. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, when he would get into the kind of the apologetic angle of things and the epistemological angle of things, he would say things like, well, our common ground is all men seek happiness. Mm -hmm. So who's going to give them the most happiness? Jesus. Well, two, two things. What if you think somebody else is going to give you more happiness? Or first of all, what if not every human being in their fallen state seeks true happiness? What's mm -hmm. going to happen then? So, you see, mm -hmm. I mean, Ray was like a, a different, he was a voice crying in the wilderness. In yeah. a way. Not everyone, I mean, people had their own reactions to him. Not everybody was just against him or things like that. But yeah. Um, but when, when students heard him, you know, he was talking to their hearts and minds at the same time. Mm -hmm. And he was really present uh, with us and mm -hmm. able to relate the gospel uh, mm -hmm. in these, which pointed to and led us into deeper relationship with Christ himself. Yeah. And then your understanding came out of that. You didn't yeah. leave, you didn't become hypothetical believers. He was calling you, here is this Jesus who's revealed in God as mm. the second member of the Trinity who takes us to the Father, my words, and, and sends us the Spirit. Yeah. And so uh, he's present, he's real, he's active. Mm. Um, he's not a deistic God. Um, and so... Uh, and his theological anthropology, see, I mean, where it really, really came out, once you, uh, as he built on the center out of Christ, he just did what he said, then that led uh, to his book on being human. Hmm. So uh, one of two questions found... I have for you, you're answering the question kind of, but it's to say, we know that Bart and Torrance, both the Torrances are roots of Ray's work. Um, what is what is the distinctive where you're recognizing he's still in the tradition, but he adds this? And I mean the theologic anthropology is gonna be part of that, but play that out. The other question you can get to at some point is are there other as others of your fellow students who went on to also do things that built out of Bart Torrance and Anderson who are worth listening to? Right. Um well, I mean, he began, uh, Ray began exp explorations then of helping others, like, for instance, at the School of Psych, he'd go over there and try to uh, get to know some of them, and and he did. Mm -hmm. um, and so Dennis Guernsey was uh, the, the fellow that he got to know the, the best. But those who are interested in a real inter integration, that is an interrelationship, of what it means to be a human being and what it means to, to in, in my terms, have these, or in Barr's terms, these creaturely capacities and potentialities. In other words, Ray was able to interact and relate to and be friends with those mm -hmm. in, in the school of psychology uh, there uh, who were, who wanted to have be Christian in what they did and said and how they related to people and trained other people. And so rather than compartmentalizing, here's, well, it's, you know, here's revelation over here. And then here, so, you know, special revelation, here's general revelation. Mm -hmm. And those who wanted to keep it compartmentalized, well, then you've compartmentalized human beings you're going to treat them as two parts. Now we'll, we'll address you as, you know, um, the natural things we know about you. And then we'll, over here, we'll, we'll treat you 
than as a human being who has a relationship to God. Yeah. And so those who are fearful of integrating because you're going to pollute one or another. Now, Torrance was about the same thing, but uh, Ray Anderson pursued it more in terms of the social sciences, whereas Tom Torrance pursued it more, far more in terms of uh, the natural hard sciences. Right. Um, right. And, and so you did, in the that, end of your doctoral work, you also did some integration work on the implications for God's relationality for systems of therapy, right? Well, uh, yes, for, for family therapies. Um, yeah. An approach to family, although it had more to do with the ethics of the family. But uh, what it was demonstrating that um, Bart's theology of relations, as I ended up calling it, which yeah. Tom Torrance just called it onto relations, um, that uh, it had implications for how to be family, what it is, what it's mm -hmm. for, and how to be in practical issues facing uh, biological families um so yes that was the implication because the idea is uh you know that bart's theology and similarly um torrance gets the same kind of uh critique as well but not so much ray anderson because he went directly at it is has yeah. all kinds of implications in terms of because it addresses the who question who is another way to put it who, who god is in has revealed in Christ and who we are in relationship to God and then who we are in relationship to one another. That's the, the easiest integrating question that I've been found able to use. And then if you start asking and starting with the how, what, why, when, where questions, right? The analytical questions right. and start asking the who question. And then you find out you can only be answered as who we are in relationship Mm -hmm. so who is the father you only know it in relationship to the son who's the spirit only in the relationship to the father and the spirit and then who are we well god is creator we are the created he is the creator that's mm -hmm. a relationship a creator and then he's also related to us as redeemer in christ so who is he in relationship to us and then who are we so Bart began some things with the three primary relations, um, mm -hmm. the, the parent-child relation, the man-woman relation, in terms of human relations, uh, and the, the uh, near and far neighbor relations. Um, three, four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he began to pursue that. So I picked up on that and, and opened that up in terms of the, if this is our theological anthropology, then here's the implications for the parent-child and the child-parent relation. Right. Now, partly I was avoiding the male-female thing because that was so heated up in the late 70s and, well, in the late 80s and 90s, and I got tangled up in that in the PCUSA. Um, yes. And I avoided that and thought it, it might be uh, come at it from over here, but nobody paid attention. So, uh, Which, when I did I, my... In my doctorate, Ray Anderson was was my external examiner outside of the outside of New Zealand, and he wanted one thing to be added to my doctorate. That was an appendix on freedom in male female relationships. So that yeah. that was the reason. And I don't know if you remember, I called you up and talked to you for about three hours and took <laughs> extensive notes on that. That was very helpful for that appendix that I wrote. So yeah, it was so, yeah, mean, it's, it's still an issue today. In fact, it's more of an issue. Uh, it is possibly. because the, the whole thing because our understanding of humanity i mean i'm really serious about this and i've only been more convinced of it in the last three years uh the more i look into this and of course if you just watch it if you see the uh the, the documentary what is a woman mm -hmm. it's quite profound because no one can answer they all know that anybody could be one but they don't know what it is they cannot define it well they the worst no case is no beginning place. would be uh, it wish there should be another doctor it was what what is a human mm -hmm. and so i mean as i said in my paper here 
You know, if the 19th century is the loss of, of God, who God is, what God is, even, and, and the 20th century is the loss then of humanity, mm. because you can't keep one without the other. Right. Um, and so those, those you, you, when you lose, uh, another way to say it, when you lose the divinity of Christ and his revelation of God, then you also use the revelation of humanity. You lose mm. track. You have no idea who you are, where you are. Yeah. And because so many, that's been a deliberate attempt uh, to, as you can uh, read in, in well, Charles Taylor or, or now Carl Truman and others are the, the, those kind of most readily read these days who are recognizing the sense of identity is just being ripped out. And we see it in mm. young people now. I don't know how many suicides you've heard of in young people. I've heard quite a few. It is really sobering. But a lot mm. of it is they are so disconnected from everything mm. uh, be because their identity, they can't even look at their bodies and that doesn't tell them anything mm. about anything anymore. Mm. So the, all the disconnection uh, from family, from church, from nation, from anything gives yeah. them no identity. And then if they're treated as if they have no identity by others through sexual abuse, or other kinds of, of, of trauma mm -hmm. and all. Uh, in my view, mm -hmm. even mask wearing. Uh, these all policies and things are dehumanizing, depersonalizing, and destabilizing. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but the whole point, and then the Christian church tries to get our identity through these various things. Mm -hmm. Instead of receiving human identity as a gift, as a gift of grace, hmm. that who we are are those who God has elected in Christ. Yeah. To be his eternal children. And yeah. that's a gift. And it's a gift you cannot, identity isn't something you can give yourself anyway in the first place. Right. Um, but for those then who are attempting to achieve their identity and it's ripped out of their hands over and over and over again, and they think that's freedom is to have no identity it's not it's it's chaos it's disorder it's disruption mm. it's dehumanizing and depersonalizing destabilizing and the main thing it allows is those who are doing it to manipulate you know, use you and, and form your minds and use your bodies for their own purposes yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh the identity in in christ when so when churches especially i see this over and over again um i don't know what you're seeing but what i'm seeing is over and over again all the so many church programs from pastors all over uh, that i've heard since i've been in re relationship with many over many years yeah and all is all the church growth stuff uh now and all the leadership stuff then really is very poor sociology psychology cultural anthropology, extremely poor, even by secular mm. standards, extremely poor. Just and a form of marketing. It comes through business, business schools. Yeah. You know, the Johari window, that will tell you everything. You know, I don't, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, uh, you know, stereotyping uh, people and mechanizing everything. Um, so, you know, all the self-help stuff, that was ramped yeah. up in the 60s and 70s. Maslow's uh, Pyramid, which is completely upside down and backwards, you know, where you have your most basic needs are, you know, physical. You know, those are your most basic needs. And this is what a human being is. So you start with the physical, huh. you know, and then finally you get to the spiritual at the top of the little pyramid. This is, this is worse than Thomas Aquinas' so-called pyramid. It's completely mm -hmm. upside down and backwards. Yeah. Uh, but then people trying to get their identity, then get their belonging, get their believing, get their security, get their identity as well from how they achieve or accomplish uh, themselves mm -hmm. in various relationships or in various 
tasks, impersonal tasks, um, often. Uh, and so, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, with it, the attack is really great. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I've seen the church asleep about this. Yeah. There's Todd, Todd Spadell, he, he wrote the book on being, or he edited the book on being person. So I, um, I think he's trying to make the switch that you're saying and invited authors to try and say, we don't have to throw out forms of therapy, but we have to start in the right place. Is that, I mean, would you say that's what Todd has been trying to do? Because he's been kind of the face of attempting to re rework the relationship between theology and psychology and so forth. Would you say that's kind of, he's taking what you just put out there as a paradigm shift? Yeah, right. And kind of working on the same basis that, well, which is really scripture with Jesus Christ at the center, at the hermeneutical yeah. center yeah. Uh, of it. Yes, right. He's been working on on that. And similarly, uh, Chris um, Kettler uh, as well has been working on it. In a, uh, and so, but, um, you know, Jack and Judith Balswick, I mean, there there is some who Ray got to know and interact extensively with uh, at Fuller. So the the Balswicks and uh, Pamela Epstein, um, hmm. and let's see who else if I can remember. Uh, there's someone I'm I'm forgetting uh, that made some. Well, of course, some Dennis Guern Guernsey, of course, was on being yeah. family it was is part of that. Yeah. Yeah. So there, yeah, there are some that, I mean, you have to, to understand what a person is. You have to understand and deal with their relationship with the living God um, through Christ. And it's really the answer is, what do you think of Jesus Christ or Jesus answer? Who do you say that I am? In the, uh, in the book you mentioned in your article on essays in honor of Ray Anderson, Incarnational Ministry, he has an article by Guernsey, the Ballswicks, Lewis Meads has an article, um, Cameron Lee has an article, oh, yeah. David and Diana Garland. Yeah. So yeah, uh, he, apparently they got through to them some as well. Yes. Yeah, he had some who uh, he was able to talk to to provide a, a the orienting platform then to integrate and to sort through other right. things um and so there are others that, that went into into practice and didn't uh write but uh, daniel price on bart's uh theological anthropology who also studied with jb torrance uh, he's also writing his, he's writing the essay on mental health for volume three of my church dogmatic series which you are writing the one on systematic theology for so daniel has been invited back into onto the stage well, good. Good. Yeah. So his his wife was a PhD who who got uh, uh, her PhD at Fuller uh, as mm -hmm. well. And so yeah, she was drawn uh, into that uh, somewhat. And then uh, Deborah Hunsinger, who was mm -hmm. uh, George Hunsinger's wife, wrote a book on pastoral theology. And then there was was she uh, there with you? Did she interface at Fuller with you? No, we weren't. No. Yeah. Um, She's and, agreed I, to write volume four on mental health in my CD series, wow. Deborah has. <laughs> so, I mean, Andrew Purvis also did uh, work on pastoral theology. He did a kind of a mid, as I understand it, uh, he did some kind of mid, mid career, mid course correction uh, where he went through some personal things and huh. really went back. He studied with James and Tom Torrance and huh. discovered that the great uh, resources were there for pastoral theology mm. um, and pastoral. And uh, was Ray part of that? Was Did Ray's work influence him? I, I, I don't really, I can't really recall yeah, yeah. Uh, right now. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Ray's book, The Soul of Ministry, is uh, quite quite important here as well, written later. Um, yep. But but really, if back to Bart, you know, if if there's no such thing uh, as a godless humanity, hmm. 
it doesn't exist. It's an unreality. Yeah. yeah. And there isn't any other place uh, to start is what, what is the nature of God's relationship with hu human beings and, and an individual human's relationship to God. Yeah. What is that? How do we describe it? Um, and the answer is Jesus is Lord and Savior, Lord and Redeemer. That is who he is. And that's who we are. Uh, we're the created and the redeemed ones. That is yeah. who and what we are and, and intended to be. So um, anything that doesn't kind of answer those questions and then fill it out, then so that you can kind of add in then later on whatever fits on that and throw out what doesn't or modify it yeah uh, so that it it does but an autonomous human being i mean all the options out there so individualism is ruled out but so is collectivism there's another naivete i mean so many progressive evangelicals that i've been very dismayed some of who have been colleagues and friends of mine for years mm -hmm. um, who've departed and just in reaction to an improper individualism have just uh, accepted a, a mindless collectivism. What is the form they take of that? What are they calling it? Well, for instance, the meme that's going around now, you know, is just, just nationalism. Oh, you, know, you have okay. to be anti-nationalistic. And so what? Globalism? You know, uh, and so th there's this idea there isn't a, a proper respect for nation. Mm. You know, it's just all, all improper. And, mm -hmm. and so we go for, you know, a collectivism, mm -hmm. uh, which is no more Christian than an individualism. And you can right. find this in Torrance easily. But one of the best and easiest places to find it is actually uh, in his, uh, his collection of sermons, The Apocalypse Today. Huh. I've read it twice in the last two years. Hmm. Um, and it's astounding how uh, basically so many uh, believing theologians who, who went through World War I and or World War II, in other words, they faced evil as a quasi-believing or a real believing person, hmm. uh, su such as Helmut Thielicke, for instance. But you can you can you can find you find it in Bart and Torrance. You find it in C.S. Lewis. Those who really see what we we need to be saved ultimately from evil itself, not just our own sin, but from the powers of evil, the deceptive, demonic, disordering, mm. disruptive, divisive powers of evil itself, for which we human beings are no match, and blind uh, largely too. Yeah. It's uh, evil is 90% deception and only 10% destruction. Yeah, yeah. We notice the 10%. That looks like 100% to us. It's not. Right, right. It's it's very, uh, very small part. But those who uh, recognized that, their theology shows it. Mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, and of course, the New Testament shows it. Why do we overlook it? Why do mm -hmm. we overlook it? I mean, Lewis was right in the sense that Yes, you can make too much of the devil or you can make too little. Well, it's been a long time when, since we've made too much of it in <laughs> any real sense. Yes. It's been far too long. Yeah. And his script tape letters is one of the best commentaries on it, just the deception of the powers at work in a sense. I mean, the insights. Well, interestingly enough, the only book of Lewis's that became widely popular in the UK was exactly that book. Yeah. And, and why is that? Why, because it was written and it came out and people realized what was mm -hmm. going on. And they read the screw tape letters and saying that explains an awful lot of what we just went through. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it was the only one. Otherwise, Lewis was panned, as you know, in the UK. Yeah. yeah. But that book well. got through. So let me ask you, this article we're looking, we've been looking at, we haven't dove into it yet, but you wrote it 20 years ago. And so to say, you know, as you as you read it and put it forward to be published in this um, 
Participatio journal on theological anthropology. Um, was there anything that you said has changed or did you pretty much say everything is the same or worse? Or you know, what was your sense in reading through it to submit it 20 years later? Well, I wanted to revisit it, yes, uh, because I, th I think, uh, in, in my view, that the need has just become greater and the naivete in the church has become even broader. Mm. Um, you know, if we just use the right techniques, we'll get our church to go, you know, just use this plan, just follow these steps, mm -hmm. um, just organize people like this and like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so much church growth. I mean, I was already in, in, the, in the 70s, I smelled a rat when, you know, the church growth institute that started at fuller seminary uh, started hammering you know the the homogeneous unit principle like what in that are you talking about well it's just gone on and on techniques principles and of course well i also i should mention here uh also reading uh, uh jacques elul hmm. i mean the technological society in which he realized that the post the enlightenment and post enlightenment is the only way to know things, and the only reason to know things is to know how things work. Mm. Is to we live by uh, not a moral legalism, but by a technical, a technological mm. legalism as to how to do things in a cause effect way, in an impersonal way. Well, yeah. Jacques Ellul saw this all throughout Europe. And so his his book, though Technological Society, in the '70s was read in in pretty much every uh, University of California university was read. It's completely forgotten. People used to say, "Is you know, how can you treat people as just numbers?" Mm -hmm. Well, this is who and what we are in in the world's economic view. Mm. We are all numbered we're given value in the actuarial systems of world economics mm -hmm. we are numbers and of course then you even have peter singer at uh princeton university who is hired who is an, the instrumentalist of the all instrumentalists and just saying is a, a human child of, of three years old uh, uh, a human child of uh, three years old is about the same, has the same uh, utility as a hog. And he's serious about this. And he's uh -huh. been teaching at Princeton for 20 some years now. Uh -huh. The only people who protested against this were those with disabilities in the Jewish rabbi and the Hillel group. Uh -huh. And everybody else, you know, shrugged their shoulders and said, well, it's private money. He can come. And, and so he promotes active euthanasia of those who don't who have lost their utility, their social utility, and their that their cost to society is not worth it. Yeah. Right. The whole basis of the, the system of values. I mean, identity is tied up with values, and the value of a person is lost if their identity is lost. So well, I yeah, I think the another part here is seeing how much then we think of people. I mean, just look at what people are saying about flourishing now. You've been reading this stuff. What is flourishing? Flourishing is the magnification of human potentials and capacities. That's how you know a human being is flourishing. So if they're not able to use their capacities or realize their potentials, they're becoming less human. Mm. We're here to realize our potentials and our capacities, of course, which can be analyzed psychologically, sociologically, economically, politically, socially, and worst of all, mathematically, actuarially, all right? That's the reducing. This is what human numbers. flourishing is, huh. and it's common. And basically, it, you're you're less. If you're not flourishing in these ways, you're less than human. Huh. 
you're less than human. And if you're told yeah. that enough, you can possibly start believing it. I'm not human. I'm less than human. I'm trying to become human because I'm trying to realize my potentials. And, and either there's something wrong with me, I won't say that out loud, or others are preventing me from realizing my human potential. Mm -hmm. And these are all evaluated, to use Bar Bart's terms, is as these are the, the phenomena of human beings. It's not what a human being is. And this is why we can't and won't recognize the humanity of others. And we can treat others who aren't realizing their potentials and their actualities, mm -hmm. then we can treat them as less than human. Mm -hmm. We can experiment with them. Yeah. We can experiment on them. For the, of course, all for the common good. All for the common good. Mm -hmm. We don't know who those individuals are. But the common good, the greatest good for the greatest number, what we don't hear is the greatest number, is also almost, all, very often very, very, very few. Because mm -hmm. it's the greatest number we can accomplish this complete good for everyone. And so mm -hmm. some have to die. And of course, the misuse of sacrifice here. You're listening and you're hearing this stuff? Yeah. Now, the notion of Christian sacrifice is being perverted every day, mm. no pain, no gain. Or, well, if, you know, if a million people have to die, someone said, I won't quote, tell you the name, I hope you know who it is. No. If a million people have to die because of this experimental thing, well, you know, too bad. Yeah. This is how we think. This is how we're huh. being trained to think. This is how we're being groomed to think. Uh -huh. And the church so, is buying it. And that surprises you? So if we were to change the title from resisting reductionism and to say we're going to write a book for the church that's promoting something, what what is the language you would use to say if we're just resisting, we're not moving them forward in the way they need to. How would you title a book that's going to follow up on the revitalizing that you're talking about of a theology of who we are in Christ? How would you change the title to promoting something? What is it that would be your church, your book to put in the hands of people in the church? Well, probably rediscovering our humanity in Christ or something or other like that. Uh -huh. Um Redescribing the rediscovering the Christ of our humanity, but the thing is, you can't just have the name. You actually have to. I mean, partly what I do is I I lead people uh, to dwell in John chapter seventeen. Mm -hmm. You have to see what the 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 nature, the quality of the relationship is first from God to us. Mm -hmm. Um, this is that yeah, retooling you're you can't just about. use the, the notion of love love again you hearing what love means these days it is so perverted or just gaseous it's it's nothing or it's everything or it's anything i want it to be hmm. it doesn't have anything to do with uh to borrow from dangerously from classical categories of the, the what's true what's good right and beautiful yes okay i'll use those terms but those can be perverted as well mm -hmm. but if those are not understood in terms of who god is in christ and what he has done for us and where he is taking us what actual the content of real right relationship is uh which is not to just make sure everybody has equanimity so what about yeah, promoting the right truth. relationship promoting right relationship with the living god i mean is there something about getting at the nature of the living god and our relationship it's the new tool that you talked about ray kind of it, rationality is so much our tool these days right that's about the hows and the whys so is there something about saying that we need to discover in the rehumanizing because dehumanizing is your subtitle so to rehumanize people, they need to understand what relationship with the living God actually looks like. Is that, well, I mean, would that be? The, the essence of the relationship is we are created to be 
living in a worship relationship of God through Christ by the Spirit, according to Scripture. It is to be a worshiper of the living God revealed in Christ, according to Scripture. You mean it's, it's to not be just that I worshiper. made a decision 15 years ago? Pardon? It's not just that I made a decision 15 well, years ago? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, yes, that's part of the existential uh, uh, number two of J.B. Torrance. J.B. Torrance, my, yes. my decision for Christ. <laughs> right. It's letting him, recognizing his lordship over life. We are created to be worshipers of God, this God, and this God alone, which means to be, yes, in responsive relationship to this God by his grace that he makes possible. And it's to become who he intends me to be in relationship with him, which is to be like Jesus Christ in character, in character as a human being. Um, so, yes, it is to will God's good, which leads to life. I mean, a, a simple, well, a simple way. I mean, one way to get at it is, is, it, uh, is John Paul's um, encyclical, right? Uh, the gospel of life. We become a culture of death. At first, when I heard that, I think, well, there may be little parts of it. But now I see Western culture is indeed, has become in its, in its culture-forming institutions. In its culture-forming institutions. It has become a culture of death. The idea is anytime you solve a human problem, think you're solving a human problem with death, you become a culture of death and subject to the devil, to evil itself, so that you can yeah. use evil means to bring about good ends. So the utilitarianism here coming back. And of course, all the ends are good for the common good. Oh, all for the common good. Yes, a number of people have to die because of it purposefully, deliberately, as a part of an experiment. Yeah. Yes, some have to, or as a part of a war. Yeah. Some have to. Some have to be sacrificed. After all, that's a Christian idea. Sacrifice. You got to sacrifice somebody somewhere. That's just how we progress. Uh, and yeah. also, so yes, it's the idea whenever you, you see kind of evil ends to accomplish so called good means especially when you see death as an answer then to life. Yeah. We yeah. become a I, culture of, of death. So for yeah. instance, in, in my view, in my view, the most dangerous philosophy out there, and there are plenty who have immense power and influence are the eugenicists. If you looked into the history of eugenics, look into it and start today. You want to find out something about what's happening in Western culture, and has been happening. G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis were already on this at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, yeah. 19th century as well. They were already aware. G.K. Chesterton's eugenics and other evils. So Sorry, Dwayne there. wants to ask a question here, I think. Dwayne's sure. got his hand up there, so go ahead. Yeah, Dwayne. yeah Gary... I, I want to pick up what you're saying about the culture of death, but this this stuff was prophesied. The Sardis Church, we forgot our identity because, you know, I tell people this, but no one takes it serious because we had the same similar problem we were addressed. Jesus visited our church, and uh, everybody thinks that's a joke, but <laughs> he said we were Sardis, and I, I thought we were Laodicea. <laughs> but you look at both of those problems because that, that's what I'm doing research on right now. Uh, the, uh, the prophetic implications of the seven churches of Revelation. And both the Laodicean church, the way Christ has to address himself to the world, he we forgot that there's a God, that there's a creator in those Laodicea. That's why you're rich and increase of goods and have need of nothing. You know, and so, and, and you know, uh, what is it, Sardis? You have a name there, your, a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead. You know, our theology didn't go back far enough. And part of what I'm arguing is that we got to go back to Paul, like like you addressed it at the beginning. 
it's this encounter that Paul had with the living Christ that he's the paradigm to change so that I was a murderer and a blasphemer, but through me, you can see that God forgives all, you know, this is where we are in the story and our culture. Like you talk about the eugenesis, like, you know, you, I'm ashamed. Our culture in Canada, so many people have died by euthanasia because people are lining up to kill themselves. That's and nobody, like, I'm fucking screaming to the fucking wall. No one's saying anything. No one in the church. It just, it makes me want to cry. It is. It is. It's grievous. It's extremely sad. But yes, people are viewing, yes, ending their own life is the solution to it. And yes. And so that's where we're going. Um, that's the solution. Now there's an opportunity for the gospel of life. I'm, I'm using uh, Tom Oden's uh, book a little bit for a course of mine. And the title of the whole, whole three volume series is The Living God. Um, but yes, that which leads to life, which leads to right relationship and fruitful relationship and ordered relationship and harmonious relationship with proper differentiations not the elimination of differentiation i mean c.s lewis has a whole list of essays on this um another aspect of kind of the humanizing element of living in right relationship is that have you noticed we're individuals that's not an individual and we are individuals we stand each one human being before the living god we're answerable to god as an individual and have you noticed we're local do you notice that we're local now locally we're in relation yes we're in relation. We have our being to express our identity in Christ towards one another and to receive that witness from uh, one another. But the idea that we're a Borg, for instance, and that we all be can be treated that way. In other words, the one size fits all. The one size fits all solution is dehumanizing and depersonalizing. And this is why psychological and sociological categorizations of people, you know, is dehumanizing and depersonalizing. You can use it as a parlor game for a while, but anybody who takes it more seriously uh, than than that, then, um, you know, in, is in big trouble. Is in big trouble, and but we like to label and name people. So it's a nominalism that reaches right down to human identity. We're nominalizing ourselves. We're thinking the realities are the names we give to ourselves. The names that we have, the names that the social sciences give us. This is who we are. This is what we are or what we aren't or what we can't depend upon anymore because they can be taken away from us. You want to think you're male? You want to think you're female? No, you're not. That's nothing. That adds up to nothing. And so, so categorization. We have six, 60 or 70 different other categories. This is what happens. The, the disordering. So that there is no possibility of the harmonization of that which is different. So the doctrine of the Trinity can be helpful here in the sense that you do have a unity that doesn't require uniformity. You have a differentiation of persons that don't allow in a dissolution of the being of God. Do you also have the same thing in Christology where you have a unity of the natures in, in the one person of Christ, but you don't have the confusion of them or the separation of them. And similarly in the image of the body of Christ where you have a true diversity then that does not destroy the unity in the head of Christ, and a unity, then, that gives room to a true diversity and a harmonization of the members to all participate. Not that there's not room, then, for the evil one to, to lead to envy and jealousy, which you also see the problem in the New Testament. But there, this is very hard to 
think in these ways. We either want fusion. This is also in my paper, right? You either, if you want unity, oh, fusion. Or if you're tired of that, you want to flee. You want to fuse or flee and be autonomous and out of relationship and go find yourself by yourself, for yourself, in yourself, of yourself. So, and Matt so has yes, his humanity there. under its fallen conditions is aiming for fusion or autonomy, fleeing. And so the pendulum goes back, back and forth. And we see this in so many relationships, yes, in churches uh, and in, in elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so, but yes, the pattern of right relationship, then where you have uh, a true uh, unity in, in Christ and in life, uh, which allows for a proper harmonious uh, differentiation and participation uh, together in Christ, but that cannot be mechanized. Hmm. So Matt be... has his hand up there. Let's go ahead okay. and bring him in for a question. Hello, go Dr. Ahead. Gary Detto, who hey. preached at my <laughs> wedding and uh, mentored me for three years at Princeton Seminary while you were on university <laughs> staff there. Mwah, great to see you. Hey, as a pastor out here, um, would love to know how um, do you think that a robust uh, Christocentric Trinitarian anthropology mitigates against the excessive kind of mechanization and um, uh, pragmatism going on in our churches, particularly with growth, church growth, kind of a wide open question. I'd just love to hear you riff on that. Well, I mean, I, th I think we this needs to kind of continue to major on the majors. So for instance, and, and that means we need to continue to talk about and reflect on and being reminded of who the God is in Jesus Christ and see the actual nature of the relations in which we live and move and have our being. And so that needs to be reviewed over and over and over again. What God's kind of love, which includes truth, life, goodness, yes, and beauty, can be added in there which has to be carefully defined but as everything anything but i think it's going back to the center is to enable people to worship to realize god is present god is active god is not a deistic god and to provide uh, times and places for individuals to come to meet the lord jesus and be in his presence, yes, together with others, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I. And for people to come and be expectant, for God to speak in and through his word, to speak in and through his word, and to make us aware, as he pleases, not under our demands for having a certain experience, but to say, to be reminded God is present, God is real, God is speaking. God is the living God. And to provide, you know, times and places for people to actually really respond in prayer, in praise, in hymns, in songs. And I think, for instance, a, a lot of the worship, so-called worship that I see is simply reduced uh, to music, and then often the music is a band up in front as playing and singing songs that no one could follow along with. So they're not actually, and, and so and people so used to being entertained is they do the worship up there and I watch it, I watch it and I say, yeah, that's really great. Mm -hmm. And think we provided uh, that. So, um, and a lot of it is to have churches be the churches that learn again how to pray together. That is to join Jesus in his intercessions. As a matter of fellowship and participation, is Jesus as the high priest and not thinking we're the worship leaders. Yes, that we can facilitate that and we can hinder it. But Jesus himself is the actual real worship leader. And so, uh, to provide, to have 
people discover that God is there, that God can break through in this fallen world. Uh, even if they're just signs and signals of the coming kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the church should become a praying church again and learn how to pray together. Learn how to pray together. It's not easy to do, especially if you're mm -hmm. out of practice. But mm -hmm. I think uh, this is what we've been trying to do in very small groups uh, here, uh, where we are now, um, to become regularly praying and partly to learn, learn actually in prayer to hate that which is evil uh, one of and you're in philadelphia up. now go ahead oh just one quick follow. yeah i have a beloved uh, colleague at my church who's really uncomfortable i don't know if uncomfortable is the right word but he's he doesn't uh he's a leader but he's he's not a, a fan of having confession in a worship service and um i am a fan of that or i i, I appreciate that i think there's need for that but he's can you speak to that? You know the role of confession or liturgy, or kind of what you're what you're getting at here about. Because I think music, and, and I I love music, but um, I think within the wider evangelical church, there there is that phenomenon you described. There's something to it, and there's something to it with, you know, hewing our worship to the reality of the, the great light Turgos and Jesus Christ. You know, can you speak to that whole that issue of you know confession and the absence of confession in the church, and how that affects what your your concerns? Well, certainly there can be a uh, significant time, not three and a half seconds, <laughs> uh, a significant uh, time, <laughs> but it needs to be set up properly. I mean, part of it is the idea is we need to confess our sins adequately before we can hear a word from God. In other words, we're setting out the conditions. No, there needs to be a proclamation of who God is and what he has done for us. He's inviting us into his presence and he is ready and able to cleanse us. And so it has to be set up with the God of grace who has provided everything for us and wants us to receive. So repentance, confession, is the way to receive your forgiveness, not conditions to get it. So yes, I mean, people have to relearn what confession of sin is. And actually, confession of sins comes after confession of faith, not the other way around. Um, so yeah, I mean, people have to kind of relearn this and then of course people can have silent times and, you know, each church would have to kind of, each congregation would have to kind of learn how to do this and let people come along. But I think over time, and it would require a certain amount of preaching, teaching, proclamation, explanation, um, of what we're doing and why. Uh, not to justify it, but as an invitation. We're going to have a time now. We need to recognize and realize. We need to recall who this Jesus is, who's present with us by his grace, who has provided everything for us, who is here to lead us into the very presence of the Father in the power of the Spirit. Hmm. We can bring to him our sins. We can bring to him. We don't have to hide it from him. So, right, to, to say with, God, you're right. You're right. This has got to go. And I am so looking forward to the day when it is completely gone and I will see it no more. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. See, and so you have you have your hand up there still. Sorry? Yeah, no, that's because I was hoping to ask another question. <laughs> yes. Give I a quick question to see there. If Matt's done. Is, is Matt finished with his, with his question? Go, go for it. Yep. Yeah, I, I think you're, because I hear this, you know, and again, this because I'm convinced that, again, because I hear James and Thomas, his theology, the back of our mind, we just do not practice the Lord's Supper enough and, and, and actually benefit for the provision he provides for us. He sets in our presence a table before our enemies. We haven't learned, like, because you're, you're talking about grace. You know, and, yes. and Tom wrote already at the second century, we already lost the meaning of grace. And, and even after the Reformation, as much as we struggled, we're justified by faith, but we that still doesn't when we understand grace. And and the manifestation of the Lord's table, like you're saying with Ray and I, you know, and, and Marty knows uh, uh, Alan Torrance, like we're, we're and, and put, putting the, the Lord's table at the front and center. That's what sets everything. There's where we, the place where he's placed his name. 
he's there amongst us, walking amongst the golden candlesticks, because that's what came to our attention when, when Christ visited us. He told us things like he knew everything, and he didn't say it in a negative way. In the way, like he wrote exactly like he wrote the churches to the letters, and he told us like. He said that we we have a spirit of religion, we have a spirit of compromise, and we have a spirit of fear that we have to deal with, and that he he was giving us some time to repent, and and part part of what came through this this artist understanding there that you know so many of us are detached from New Testament theology. We we all have our own denominations, and we go back as far as we can with our own fictional narrative to the you know how we claim Paul and Jesus as, as the source of our teaching yet, you know, it's, I, you know, I've reduced, uh, you know, what um, the getting ready for the bride, you know, and the bridegroom, I mean, righteous acts of saints. Well, I thought for 20 years, well, what the hell is the answer to that question? Well, it's acts two. They continued in the apostles teaching, breaking bread fellowship, all one word. And then the prayer, we, we got to get back to Paul's teaching and understand that he's, he's the one, for us who are uncircumcised, understanding that when when he's dealing with the Lord's table, that's the central act of worship. We need to say stop. You know, he said he said don't do it in an unworthy manner. It's not that we're unworthy people because Jesus makes us worthy. And all throughout our correction and reformation, we never got that right. So people don't even come to the table. And that's a you know we sing do this everything but do an into counter the living God at the table where He's there to fellowship with us. You know, and so. Well, I, yeah, I I agree. Very few have gotten their way. Uh, Ray Anderson did, <laughs> but um, but uh, yes, I I think we need uh, liturgical forms, which just means regular forms, in in a proper pattern that presents who Christ is and provides ways of uh, responding to the truth of who God is, and that right we have been justified by Christ we, we God has killed any need or possibility of us justifying ourselves so we can come and offer ourselves to him all that we are all that we have and there's several ways to do that in a worship service so i i think yes we need to regrasp a, a liturgy and it should lead to the central uh, point um, I think much more scripture ought to just be simply read uh, in, mm -hmm. in worship. Um, the, the practice of reading an Old Testament passage, a psalm, and a gospel is a good idea, um, or a New Testament passage. But I think it all ought to lead, and, the, and the, the preaching ought to lead people, again, to say is, okay, so right, I'm ready. Let me then receive the life of christ again today where can i go oh there <laughs> it's a table set before me mm -hmm. there it is we can go uh, there so i think yeah having providing so the central act of the church and what it has to offer the world so what are we saying about being missional here we go again, you know, doing stuff out there. No, our most missional action is being a place of worship, public worship, that is public access to our worship. And can you invite people in? Of course, you do, you can. You ought to be looking for opportunities. God is at work. You don't know who, when, where, or why. God is at work. But to worship is the public place where we bear witness to the truth and reality of the real presence of God in the world. And we show forth and we're reminded is who God is in relationship to us and who we are in relationship to him. And that we're engaged in a real interaction, personal interaction with this God in prayer, in praise, in listening to the word and in receiving it receiving it with our ears and receiving it with our mouths and our hands. And that needs to be replayed, replayed, replayed over and over again. This is the witness of the church. Now, yes, there can be other opportunities, but we need to keep the center, the center, the center of the center. Uh, I mean, even, even secular people who've restudied 
Christianity and Roman history like Tom Holland. I don't know if you've heard of him. Anyway, re recently he's, he's saying is what I'm hearing in the churches is you can get anywhere in secular society. Why aren't you giving us what you have to offer as the church? I don't need kind of more practical ideas of how to be more successful in life. I just don't need another kind of group of people to hang around with, tell jokes, smoke a cigar. He says, I've already got all that. The church had to have something different to have crosses on their graves. Tom Holland. Yeah. So if you yeah. were invited on Good Morning America and they said, Gary, come and tell us what you have to offer us. You know, we want to give you a space to speak. What would you say? And then, have you considered who Jesus Christ is? If you haven't, I'd recommend you start today. Who is he? Who is he? Do you know anything about him? What have you heard of? Who do you say that he is? That's the question of life. And it's directed to you right now, right here, this moment. You can never say you never heard it. You've heard it now. Jesus is inviting you. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who Actually, is this Gary, Jesus? You're, 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 you're hammering on there about the nature of time. So I think part of our problem is our lack of meaning and identity is because we don't understand the meaning of time anymore. We can encounter God now. Today is a day if you won't harden your sin. We remind each like we live in the past and we live in the future with all these abstractions. It's now that we can celebrate. It's now that we have joy. It's now that we're having fellowship. It's now that we're experiencing koinonia. It's now. And yes, now well, is the day of your salvation. We 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 and so when we're at the, in our church encounter. We're somehow parroting something with either in the past because of remembrance and a proper misunderstanding of memory, or we're projecting ourselves into some kind of eschatological or es uh, apocalyptic delusion. And instead of enjoying, abide in my love. This is now you can abide. Faith, hope, and love are present tense. And same thing with faith, hope, and love have to do with future, past, present, but love, joy, peace. If our meetings aren't like, James used to say that all the time, and, and Dr. Houston, Jim Houston, his friend, you know, if you're not experiencing, you know, joy, and, and I can tell how you live your Christian life, if there's joy in your wife's face or not, <laughs> you, it should, it's, your closest people should actually reflect the kind of character and life that you live, and we don't, the people in the world don't see that, and, because we, we smell like dead men's bones, like we have a name, we're alive, but we're dead, you know, and we, we, well, haven't, I, I we think... haven't shared with each other the joy we have. Well, there's a couple of problems. People are still r running from God. I mean, the history of Western culture is to escape God and to escape grace. They don't want it. They hate charity. They don't want it. C.S. Lewis's book, you know, All the Reasons Why. You want all the reasons why? <laughs> Read the great, uh, the great Divorce by Lewis. So it's not just, as it were, Christians aren't doing their thing. Um, but I, I think, yes, there, there are things that, that where it could be far more properly, uh, centered and yes, it is very easy to be deistic, uh, to summarize God is at a, a distance. Uh, I don't buy though the notion that, that some have been promoting that we're so, the Christians have been so heavenly good that there have no earth, sorry, so heavenly minded, there have no earthly good. Christians in the West haven't been heavily minded for centuries. And consequently, yes, they may have been far less earthly good than they may have been, but they haven't been earth heavenly minded, not in any real significant sense, not in the sense that the book of the Revelation would have us be, not to have that kind of hope. And so we can afford to be kind of deistic and talk about heaven, uh, but we really haven't been truly heavenly minded. And, and that is to know Christ in his ascension. In his ascension and in the hope of his real return. 
And yes, all the arguments about premillennial, postmillennial, and trying to figure out how, when, where, and why, and, and how we can trigger the second coming and whatever else we've been up to have been so distracting in terms of the hope is that, yes, by the by the Spirit, this Jesus is Lord, and he is present, and the church is going to be a suffering church. Mm -hmm. Why don't we see that? There is a spiritual battle going on. It's not a dualistic spiritual battle, but it is a real one due to the patience of God. And the church has been under attack. The only threat to the evil one is the church, those who belong to Jesus Christ. They're the only ones who are a real threat to the evil one. Everybody else is too naive and weak and distracted to put up any resistance. The evil one is, is attacked, has been attacking, and it will. The church is a suffering church, but we don't want to hear that either. We really don't. But if you, uh, I mean, look at what Torrance really says. Look at his chapter, for instance, on uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ and evil in Incarnation, chapter 7. Look at what he says in the Apocalypse. And actually, it's all, it's partly, is it's spread all over. But look in the New Testament. What is Jesus saying? So we want to avoid that. We want to be popular. We want to look in. We want to find common ground. We don't want to offend anybody. We want to be nicey-nicey to everybody. And the meanwhile, people who are really looking for hope don't get it from us. And so we pick up, you know, the world's agenda and all and, and try to look as much like the world as we can without completely leaving Jesus behind. And so we take up the agenda. We don't even uh, think about it. If it sounds moral, if it sounds like it's the high moral ground, whatever you do, don't do anything that might kill your grandmother. If you know what I'm talking about. So Matt and has so raised his hand again there. Soon, so. soon as soon as you hear that, oh, we know what to do. It sounds like you're taking the high moral ground. That's what you should do without any further thought, without any further investigation, without any other consideration. And especially it gives you the right to become the accusers of the brethren who don't agree with you. No, no thought. So whose hand was that? I have Matt. Matt's got a question there. Okay. Off mute, Matt. Matt, mute. 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 Sorry. There you, sorry. Go. Um, there you go. Got it. So uh, there was a great, in the Presbyterian Constitution, my form denomination, Peace to USA, there was a great line there about, it said that we are to strive, something like we are to strive to have a quality of relationships that commends the gospel. I, I, was, I always love that line in that book. Um, that maybe some of what was said before made me think of that. But one qu one question or thought was, I know as a, a senior pastor overseeing a staff and elders, one of the things that I notice is sometimes people's focus on doing can get them disconnected from their sense of being and being with each other, just being present to each other, and that that can create issues um, where disconnects. And, and it feels like part of the role as a pastor, of course, we, we have plenty to do, but it, and we want to fan that to flame and, and, and support that, encourage that. But it seems like there's this, you know, you know, the old being versus doing thing, maybe that's a little simple, but I just want to Gary, your thoughts on that, like grounding that idea Christologically and in Trin God's intertrinitarian life, the being and the doing with inner relationships among leaders in the church who are maybe getting so caught up in their doing that it's, disconnects them from each other's being and it results in rupture disconnect you know this you know a lack of quinonia you see what i'm getting at can you can you riff on that a bit for me well yeah i mean any any doing ought to be an expression of our being who we are in christ so i mean yeah when when there's when the the pragmatism of, of what needs to happen and most of the time and effort is is spent on that um, and where there's just this task and that task. And then the idea of efficiency, 
of getting it done. Um, and that can, and then, you know, or following a certain pattern, whereas the relationships, then what happens is the relationships are run on the basis of getting the task done. So our purpose for being then is getting this task done. And so I heard of uh, one, one pastor um, who was new, new to a church and, uh, she noticed that this particular event that took place once a year was a kind of a big event. Uh, they ended up realizing, brought out the worst in them because there was arguing, bickering, and there was um, uh, resentments from the past and all power plays and this and that to get the job done, to get this one event they put on um, and all. And the pastor just laid out and saying is, you know what, if we can't figure out how to do this in a way that doesn't bring out our worst relating to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're not going to do this. Now, if we want to do it, we're going to have to figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't bring out our worst. Period. And someone said, well, who are you to say that? She said, I'm the pastor of the church in this body of Jesus Christ. And this is what God is concerned about, the quality of our relationships and the quality of our character. And if we set ourselves up to be tempted to be the worst, we're not going to do it. So let's figure this out. Now, they modified some things. Apparently, that was pretty much the end of the story as she told it. But they modified some things. They did end up, some things were preserved, other things were eliminated and all that. But that, what is it doing to the quality of our relationships to do what we do? And of course, made the main thing we do is we do worship and prayer. The other thing uh, that, that she was saying is every meeting, every meeting, every time we get together, we set apart time to really pray, not just say a prayer, but to sit down and pray. And one of the ways she did that is had a prayer walk. She had them get up and walk around in the church or wherever they are and pray like that so that it wouldn't just be an opening perfunctory prayer, but you're ask, you're recognizing, Lord, you are here, you're Lord, we're living by your grace. We trust in your presence. We trust in your leading. We don't want anything then to detract from who we are in you, what you've done for us, and all we do and say to reflect that. And we're not going to do anything that we know is going to set us up for that. So this kind of setting aside five to ten minutes of prayer, no matter what committee meeting, no matter what it was that the church was doing, and a lot, let it become perfunctory. So that's a discipline. But that's what she saw the, the role of a pastor uh, being. Um, and of course, some people, she said, quit. And she said, well, they just weren't ready for it. So mm -hmm. um, maybe the Lord will provide other people. I mean, another thing is don't have people really uh, doing things that they're not ready or truly willing and able to do freely. So this gets to, you know, the, the BART thing to do th things, you know, um, eye to eye, ear to ear, serving with hands and all gladly and freely. That's what a right relationship, we are part of being humans in response to God are those who are, yes, freely able to respond as agents given, yes, room to respond, room to respond freely and gladly in this. So it, that's what we're trying to give people freedom to do stuff in, freely and gladly, face-to-face, -face, person, eye-to-eye, mouth-to-ear. That's a beautiful section in the Church Dogmatics if you haven't read it. Too. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's not the essence of our humanity, but it is how we are to express our humanity one to 
uh, another as we are in Christ, mm -hmm. as we're in Christ. So all the doing then <clears throat> becomes an, a, a free expression. And so, yes, yeah, so this means maybe a lot of hard uh, discussions uh, that Kathy and I have had a number of years ago at, at a church we were in. But some people need to be put on sabbatical, you know, and they be, need to be relieved and saying is you're not, a, you know, you're not in a good place. You need to work on other things. There are other priorities for you in your relationship with God or with your children or with your wife or with your neighbors or work or something or other. Um, and so if people are, are doing it out of kind of resentment and all and lording it over others or using legal descriptions and means, right, to, uh, to regulate how they relate to people or don't, you know, either get with the program, you know, it's kind of like the idea, you know, get with the program or get out, you know, uh, in a mean, so sorry, those who have that attitude who just legally try to control and lord it overs rather than pastor them out of positions they shouldn't be in or they're burned out on or they're resentful of or they're using it to lord over and finding those who can do it freely and gladly. And usually, I think, temporarily, not people have people um, locked in forever that's not relational that's not international that's not a free being a true agent in responsibility to the lord so i think a lot of things innovative ought to be done experimentally and not necessarily require everybody to go along but experimentally and saying is all right we're going to try this after discussion this and that and the other kind of weighing things up all right it seems to me we're at the place where we we ought to try this for limited amount of time, and then we're going to evaluate how it's going. It's going to be a live experiment, and where we actually look at what happens. We've done an outreach program. Not one person has come to Christ and been baptized into his body. We've done this for five years. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Yeah, it's good. It's fine. People take advantage of us. <laughs> they like the good stuff we do. But how is this? What people need is to know who they are in Jesus Christ and to begin to live in that and receive it actually from others. So part of it is having live experiments where we're actually listening and talking and dis discerning. And it's not going to follow the same pattern. It's not going to be one size fits all. It's just not going to be. So, I mean, what I always, what I've said from time to time, yes, God calls us to kind of make plans and this and that and the other and to set up. Or to use T.S. Eliot, I believe, gave this image is, yes, God calls us to build altars. But don't be surprised if the fire doesn't come down somewhere else. <laughs> In fact, yeah. it will come down. My, my 20 years of, of fundraising for being on InterVarsity staff proved that every six months at least. All my efforts never paid out in exactly the way I thought how God provided was always in a different way. But that doesn't mean I didn't do. I didn't send out the prayer letters. I didn't make calls. I didn't talk with people. I didn't let people know about what the ministry was uh, and all. But it was never predictable. But we want predictability. We want security. We want safety. We want surety rather than we want the faithfulness of God and how that's going to work out. And it's rarely predictable. And it shouldn't be. Um, so, you know, letting people take agency and freely give and serve and not lord it over one another and not create plans that are so tight and mechanized is that what mediates our relations is the thing we need to do. Mm -hmm. That's just another form of legalism, where the, the activity, the event, 
then determines how we relate to each other. It sets up the conditions of our relationship. Mm. So this is what it means to be kind of more personally engaged. Now, some things are less that a, a congregation would do would be less personal. I mean, counting, you know, the the uh, the offering. I mean, yes, there is honest and dishonest ways of doing that. So it's not completely absent, but that's going to be, yes, less personal. But that is a Jewish... brilliant and fascinating point. That's vintage Deto right there, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, Gary, there's been lots of comments that have gone alongside. There's a question here. Do you think that each congregation should be commissioned at the end of the service to preach the gospel to their families, friends, etc.? So that's the coming out of a service and how this going out makes a difference. Well, I, I think how I would say it is God is alive. God is at work in surprising ways. Don't try to outmaneuver God. Now, look for opportunities. There may be something and someone, an opportunity that you did not expect where you will be able to point them to Christ. And it may be a very simple way, or maybe, so be ready, folks. When you go out there, be ready. The Spirit of the Lord is out there. He is the Redeemer. He is the Savior. He is chasing people down. He's the Hound of Heaven. Now look, he may give you an opportunity. So don't be surprised if he does. Be looking for it. And you don't have to make it happen. God's going to make it happen. So look for it. Be ready. Don't be dull. Don't be pessimistic. But don't try to predict it. Hmm. So in the name of Jesus, we go out. So you see, I mean, it has to be like that. It's, well, it's... Uh, Participation. I know Marty used that a lot in his art, uh, article in here, and it's very important to participate in the Lord's ministry and on to, um, you know, it, Andrew Purvis, you know, Crucifixion of Ministry. Read that book if you haven't. It says, if, if you th think your ministry is, is dying, it might just be that God is killing it because it's not your ministry. He's taking it away yeah. from you. If you think it's Amen. yours and under your control. <laughs> and so he is ministering. He is at work. But it's going to be surprising where it happens. But yes, look. So yes, if you commission people in that way on the faithfulness of God, instead of getting right, the reverse is God is only can, be, can only be as faithful as you are. So in that kind of motivational scheme, if you don't, then God won't. So no, God will. Now, you may or may not participate, but God's at work. And so look for opportunities to participate in what he is doing, small or large. I mean, all, all the stuff about heroism also is another bunch of nonsense. Jesus did not call us to be heroes. It's just nonsense, complete, total that just feeds the ego, and then when it doesn't happen, crashes it mm -hmm. and all. We are simply to be witnesses in small ways, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do. Um, and so yeah, look for opportunities. So that way, Jesus Christ himself, real and actual, is leading the way of grace and giving you the pr privilege of participating. And what a joy uh, that is! And actually, Gary, I I've been this stuff I've been doing on. We haven't really, you haven't really heard me talk or go off on my soapbox, but I'm convinced because like, James told me to to go back in. He said, by the time you get through your doctrine of Trinity and doctrine of God and work on your Christology and your doctrine of the Holy Spirit in the Church, you never get to the sacraments, you know. And that's so he told me to start at the Lord's Supper and work my way back. And, and from participating at the Lord's table, I, I've learned so much. You know, John 17, that's that's where you teach. And John's discourse, that's where you teach the Trinity is at the table. But the point I want to make about what, you, what you're saying is, wouldn't it be easier for you to find the gospel? We're inviting people to the Lord's banquet. 
you know, instead of inviting people to church, you want to come to the dinner bank and celebrate the victory we have in Jesus Christ. Our shepherd's come. <laughs> he, he's come to give us victory over sin and death. He's set a table in the presence of our enemies. We can celebrate. He gives us the Holy Spirit. You know, there, there's a rediscovery in, in biblical theology now where what our meetings are, it's actually a reconstitution of the divine council that we lost in the garden. Because Jesus is up in the heavenly sanctuary after the priest of Melchizedek. Now we can ask anything in this second Adam's name. And if it's according to the will of the Father, he'll answer us. That's how these signs and wonders are interconnected with the spirit on the earth and Christ in the heavens. We need to rediscover the supernatural. You know, that's why we're never any earthly good. Because we're, we're as dumb as the, about the transcendent as, as the blind. You know, and, and yeah, we should know about that because that's our hope. That's where we're going. <laughs> yes, well, yeah. I, I think yes. And I think the, the place to, to do that is there is a center and it ought to be the center of Christians, whether it's two or three or more gathering together in his name where it's all, yes, being reminded of who he is and that he is present as part of who he is, the one that is present here and at work in ways by his word and his spirit, and that calls for our participation, our responses. Uh, and so, right, we, we present, and then there's uh, elements of responding. And those can be somewhat orchestrated, even though they can be, there, there can be times and places where it's not exactly the same kind of thing. But what helps people participate is to know what is going to happen instead of kind of changing it up every minute. This is what C.S. Uh, Lewis was talking about. If you, if you read his book, there's a lot of uh, changes. What liturgy does is it actually facilitates your participation because you don't have to pay attention to what's changed now. You don't have to pay attention. You're not distracted from that. And it all ought to center on worship is about Yes, who God is, the God who is present, the God who is Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ and who speaks to us through his word uh, and his spirit. So that's what we ought to be reminded uh, of. Yes, right then and there and provide a variety of ways for people to respond, not just one way. But yes, the center point is to come and receive the life of Christ his body and blood, uh, to take it in. So, yes, and to realize, right, he's leading our, our worship. We're not leading it. We're not in charge of it. Mm -hmm. So in this article, reductionism is the key thing. We haven't focused on that, and yet maybe it's been the theme <laughs> of the whole thing. And it's not just a problem of the world. It's just as much a problem of the church. We reduce humans to, you know, this is a giver, or this person will take up roles. I mean, we have our own ways of reducing people to uh, what they do instead of who they are. Um, and so the whole nature of what 20 years ago you wrote, um, as you said, it hasn't gotten particularly better. Your comment on page 98, it is my conviction that the most fundamental challenge arising in our post-enlightenment, indeed post-Christian Western and Westernized cultures, does not consist in the divergence or even disintegration around matters of morality, social, economic, or political issues. It involves the loss of what we mean by being human. So, I mean, there's there's the nutshell of all of the categories within which the reductionism of losing the seeing of persons as those who are God's beloved sons and daughters and that we should treat them um, in like way and those who are so contradictory to it, we still treat them um we try to look through the eyes of Jesus to see even them with a kind of love and respect and maybe protecting people from them who they might harm because love calls us to not only protect those who are vulnerable, but to stop those who are doing horrible things. As in the case of the woman caught in the act of adultery, who, whoever among you has, is about sin cast the first stone as a loving thing to stop people from harming. So there is a revitalization of a very specific understanding of love that really guides this this journey here and a loss of love in the world of really seeing the personhood of Jesus as one who does love us, of participating his love in our families and our neighborhoods in the world in such a way that it's even recognized as love maybe is a huge problem. And so the uh, it, it comes back to people really knowing the person of Jesus, which is primarily the task of the church. 
right? The and whole Jesus. You know, about the whole Jesus. Jesus throughout the whole New Testament, it actually, yes, does lead to the ascended Jesus that we see yeah. in, in the book of the Revelation. And we yeah. can't just know about him as ascended. We have to know him personally in his ascension as the present and living Lord, the paraclete who comes by his spirit to speak to us by his Holy Spirit to awaken the Abba cry within us. Um, where does your hope lie that this is a possibility? This is kind of the last question I'll ask you. Where is your hope that what you propose here is the, the disease? What is it, and recognizing Jesus, you know, as you've been saying, Jesus is ultimately responsible, but what is it we can do in the places that we live? And some of us um, are leaders in churches and some of us sit in the pews in churches. What is the hope that you have that your work is going to awaken something in people that will make a difference? Well, at best, I could say it's a mustard seed conspiracy, to, mm -hmm. to borrow from Tom sign years ago. Yes. Um, you know, it's a seed that plants, and I would say is the whole thing of kind of, they, we are individuals and we're local. And part of it is, uh, yes, you can be aware of the, the larger picture, but we live primarily locally and individually and in the relationships where we have and part of it is yes to plant seeds to point mm -hmm. others to christ not to ourselves or even our analysis of the problem mm -hmm. uh or the solution and certainly not to become accusers of the brethren which is not my intention uh yeah. but you kind of alert people you know saying well, as far as i can tell this is not a good thing you know yeah. it, it seems to me uh we need to get back to the center yeah so Gary? i mean so oh, i think you know there are seeds out there there are seedlings out there whether it will come together um and now i don't you know i don't know but i you know i plant these little seeds as i've given opportunity yep. uh here and i trust you're doing the the same and i i do have to look at you know jesus dealt with 12 well 11 and and then well then back up to 12 um uh you know yeah. it was and you know god you know you plant you water but god gives the growth mm -hmm. you know or the sower goes out to sow the seed he goes home and he goes to sleep and it grows he knows not how. Mm -hmm. um, so my, you know, yeah, I mean, some days it seems so overwhelming. It, it does. And yet, you know, the, I look for little opportunities uh, myself. I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty much what I'm, <laughs> what I've been talking to you about yeah, uh, yeah. as I'm able. And so, yeah, I don't look to be kind of any kind of uh, hero or the other thing that, that bugs me and apparently bugged Karl Barth too is being kingdom builders. We're not building any <laughs> kingdom at all. If there's a, Empire a tower that thing. was built, it was Babel. Yeah. Um, we're, not, we're not kingdom builders. We're not heroes. Um, but God will give us opportunities to bear witness mm -hmm. to him uh, and to borrow uh, Bart's categories to bear witness that are partial, temporary, and provisional. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And that will be signs. Signs will be able to embody locally, personally, signs of the coming kingdom and the lordship of Christ. So signs of it. But, yeah. you know, how effective they are or how extensive they are or how intensive they are. I mean, who knows? Um, so, you know, that's, that's just my hope. It's selling yeah. seeds. Excellent. Gary, well, can I just ask one more question from Gary? Just a quick one. As long as it's really quick, because we're about the yeah, time just, to shut down. Yeah, so. yeah. Gary, would you, D David Torrance actually said, you know, he, he thought communion could be shared together or by yourself even, would you recommend, you know, even like there's two or three guys together, we start having meal around, like the original meal around Lord's table, start practicing in our homes, having 
Lord's Supper, worshiping that way, getting mm -hmm. our mindset around this yard where, where Jesus is there in our midst when we have that meal and share, whether it's two of us, three of us, hundred, a thousand, you know, and start practicing this theology of worship. So we realize like we, we don't do anything except receive, you know, what, what did Tom used to say? Nothing to the cross I bring, but, you know, or, or cling to the cross. I forgot how that goes, but because we, because the way we do things in order, we seem to think we got to do something. We got to sing. We got, you know, James used to talk about, we sing to get God in the right mood to hear us. Or like the, the gospel is just, the gifts are without repentance because God is love. That's it. And that's, that's, that's who God is. And that's who we're proclaiming this God who loves us, even though we're not worthy, but he he has made us worthy persons in Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, even Calvin allowed for uh, for communion to be given at, at home, uh, basically by the parents. But the idea here is that they still have to be set aside so that they become acts of worship. They still, there need to be ways of setting this aside so that it doesn't become common. In other words, there, otherwise we get into another natural theology when we start saying everything's holy. You know, every meal is holy. So I would always recommend that it, at least uh, the passage uh, from Corinthians you know, about what we're doing when we're doing and that the elements be set aside and consecrated. The natural elements have no power in and of themselves to do any of this. It's not another form of natural theology and kind of the ordinary. It is extraordinary. So if in the home, the, the reading of scripture that we are re-participating in the original supper of the Lord and the original giving, so as long as it doesn't become common, ordinary, because part of our loss of the human is the loss of the holy. And so when we've made everything holy, where youth pastors used to say is, well, we'll just use, you know, uh, saltine crackers and Coke, Coca-Cola. Um, no, it's not common and ordinary. And so, and they need to be set aside. This is what we do when, in the words of consecration, it is by the special activity of the Holy Spirit that these things become a participation in communion. So if people know, kind of have some idea of what they're doing, so then, okay, they can. But I think it would take some training. And of course, Calvin was counting on the elders being well trained so that they could do these in, in their homes. And if you want to train parents. Uh, well, most it. of the people here in our dialogue, they're all ministers or ordained. <laughs> so that's why I brought the question up because, because we can learn this teaching ourselves by practice. And we realize, you know, there's potential there for healing and for wholeness and for celebration. Yes, there is. Anytime we gather. Well, Gary, there's been a whole uh, river okay. of comments that have been along the side in the chat. Um, some of the, can you save of the those discussions. Since, and, uh, what's that? Can you save those for me? Since I haven't. I don't, I don't know how to save them. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Um, if somebody can tell me how to do it, then I can do it. But I just want you to know they're there and people at the end saying thank okay. you and thank you. Um, so you're there, welcome. There has been much, much conversation that you generated today. It seems like wherever you show up, that's the fruit. The seed begins to grow <laughs> before the, the sun has left the room. So, okay. so anyway, hey, we just are very grateful for your article, your original article, yeah. um, the years of faithfulness in teaching these things, and the hope that we have that uh, there is a Jesus who carries these things in the future. You are a servant. We are servants. And so we participate and have confidence in his doing the work and that we're invited by grace into that. So thank you for taking time to be with us today and uh, blessings on you. And the Lord be with each one of you. Thank you, Gary. Every blessing. You. Mm -hmm. Thank Bye -bye. you. Take care. Bye-bye.